how is this new type of development that we, we pioneered after World War II going to evolve into the future? How are we going to uh, deal with our, our suburbs that, as they go through their down cycle? Will they be retrofitted? And if so, how will they be retrofitted into the new type of development? So without further ado, um, Great. Thank well, thank you, Nathan. So I'm uh, really happy to be here and celebrate with all of you um, Today is my one year anniversary since I wrecked my car, and I didn't replace it. It started as this experiment of like, I wonder how long I can go car free. And my husband bet I would never make it through the winter. Um, actually, winter turned out to be a breeze. Summer, in Atlanta, this is Atlanta, where I am living car free. Summer was actually much harder. Thank God I'm an academic and I don't have to commute in the summer. Uh, but yeah, I'm that lady that, that Jeff referred to, the not quite 60 um, year old who bikes to work, I bike for my groceries, I take Uber when necessary, but I, I actually, I'm such a geek. I was monitoring my trips for the first half of the year and then I kind of got bored with it, but um, I, I only took Uber about four times to work. I only got drenched once, took one tumble, because I really was getting into banking on the curves and um, hit some gravel. I'm kind of more scared of gravel than cars. But anyway, I, I honestly, I never want to own a car again. I, I am so much, I'm in the best shape I've ever been. I'm, and all my colleagues, they start looking at Emily, I'm just not too happy. <laughs> I've turned my commute trip into recreation. Um, and I can truly say that when I first started this, it was just this experiment. I fully expected that maybe in a month, eh, I, I'm going to go buy a car. And I just am here to say, it's so much easier than you think. If I can do it in Atlanta, really, uh, there, are, there are, experiments are really, really valuable things. And frankly, we're at a time now where um, we are starting to see some pretty interesting experiments in suburbia. So, uh, we've, and I'm really, fo my, my research focuses on the, what we're doing with the aging properties, uh, aging suburban properties that we basically built mostly post-war. Um, I maintain, I believe, the world's only database. No one else would do this. Um, that tracks successful examples of how dead malls, dead big box, aging office parks, dying commercial strip corridors, strip malls, branch banks, golf courses, subdivisions, garden apartments, you name it, typical suburban property types have been retrofitted into more sustainable places one way or another. Now I'll admit the bar is not especially high because Sustainability wasn't on anybody's radar screen in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's hard. In, in turn, in relation really to what we were building. We mostly just talked, and Ian McCarg, Joe just brought up, was telling us where not to build, but not really how to build in a more sustainable manner. So there's um, lots of interesting, you know, it, it, as we have watched this, this post war suburbs kind of play out. We've become aware of so many unintended consequences. Uh, you know, it turns out that we have, you know, instead of that dream of the ease and convenience, of course, we have tremendous traffic and a lot of dependence. We basically have built a system. The system now re requires us to have overburden our arterials, while we have extremely underused local streets because nobody wants to cut through traffic in the neighborhood. So we all burden it all, and you know, the system is a vicious spiral and doesn't work. Public health, I'm so glad Jeff showed you know, the, the um, maps of obesity. Well, it turns out if you zoom in closer on those maps, human sprawl and suburban sprawl correlate. Um, it is, in fact, the, the, you know, the folks who are sitting all day uh, in an office, driving back and forth, sitting in their cars, and then going home and sitting on the couch uh, watching TV. That is about the most you know, unsustainable, unhealthy lifestyle uh, that, we, that we see. That obesity leads to extremely high rates of heart disease, 
uh, diabetes. Um, suicide actually correlates with um, the lower the density. Uh, and yet the number one cause of car crashes is um, for anyone under, uh, number, number one cause of death for anyone under age 35 is car crashes. And it, it's especially high for teenagers in the suburbs. That's, you know, so we've, we've had this notion for over 100 years that the suburbs are the healthy place to raise your family. It goes back to a 19th century concept that, of, you know, that the, the big health threat is infectious diseases from the overcrowded cities. Which in the 19th century, there was some reason to be afraid of that. Today, that is not the number one health threat. It is the chronic diseases that are lifestyle related, uh, which lead to obesity as, as the epidemic we now face. So it's not to say that the cities are all inherently necessarily you know, a whole lot healthier. It varies enormously. Um, but it's certainly the suburbs are not as healthy as we thought. Um, issues of climate change and sustainability. I mean, certainly the suburbs, again, are, are um, not exactly, you know, in some respects, it's great to have a lot of that green cover, uh, but suburbanites in general have higher carbon footprints than urbanites because of all the driving and all the detached buildings. The more detached buildings you have, the more energy you are leaking from all that surface, the exterior surface, the more that you are stacking, you know, building uses on top of each other, or sharing party walls, stacking them alongside each other, the less energy per capita uh, that you are using. So the more compact we can build, uh, generally we see much lower, much lower carbon footprints and much lower per capita water and energy use. And that gets into some of the issues that Joe was talking about in relation, in relation to affordability and how the municipalities really cannot afford to the maintenance costs of low density suburban development. Joe clearly showed the case. Um, even in terms of the individual households, it's really been quite interesting. I mean, for generations, the suburbs provide, were the home of the middle class. Uh, they were seen as, as the affordable option for working families, <coughs> and yet, the pattern has really, our default model of affordable housing in this country has always been a drive till you qualify. The cheapest housing is going to be on the cheapest land, which is the furthest out. So you just drive till you qualify for a mortgage, and each generation is driving a little further and a little further. And we've been leapfrogging and doing this for so long now that in fact the savings associated with that cheaper house are more than eaten up by the additional transportation costs, and usually by those who can least afford it. And in particular now, the other sort of, you know, it comes as a bit of a surprise to folks, but um, since 2005, more Americans in poverty have been living in suburbs than in cities. The cities have been gentrifying. There's been an enormous, enormous growth, and that's, that's 2005, that's before the recession. So those numbers have escalated in the recession, and the needs and costs, uh, especially uh, for, for the poor in suburbia and the lack of access uh, to jobs, to transit, to, to, to affordable transportation becomes really extremely dire. So these, you know, nobody planned this, but uh, this is sort of what we've seen. Now, nor did anyone plan that we would see quite as much uh, obsolescence in our built environment. About one-third of our enclosed shopping malls are dead or dying. Strip malls, big box, we don't even know really how many big boxes, dead big boxes we have. Um, the one that is, has me actually especially concerned right now uh, is, is this the office. Suburban office vacancy rates have been hovering around 14 to 22%. I am seeing office parks tanking. Um, in several parts of the country at remarkably rapid rates and it's severely affecting tax base uh, for communities as a lot of the same, that the 1980s is really the peak of office park construction uh, as they were, flee, as a lot of corporations fled the underinvested in cities with, that had decaying infrastructure at the time uh, to be out closer to the CEO's house 
Well, now the rule of thumb is actually exactly the opposite. There's a bit of a labor shortage for those digitally savvy uh, young knowledge workers, and to the degree that some of those folks want to live in cities, now the corporations, in many cases the exact same corporations, well, they're looking around at their 1980s vintage office park. It's no longer Class A. The crumbling infrastructure is, in fact, the suburban roads. And it's the cities, which is where the young people are living, that, that, that they want to hire. And those corporations, are, a lot of them, are moving back into, back into the cities. Um, when a mall dies, it's usually about 50 to 100 acres. It's a nice development size for a neighborhood. Uh, when an office park dies, it's often 500, 1,500 acres. These things are enormous. Uh, and we, we're still just trying to figure out kind of what we do with them. But, but what, you know, so on the one hand, one can get really depressed at sort of, it is depressing when you, you know, go by these dead places. Nobody likes to see a business die. Or you get off it, you say, we get a do-over. This is our opportunity. This is where these are the sites that now will allow us to address the 21st century challenges that they were never designed to deal with in the, in the first place. So those issues of affordability, of changing climate, of uh, water and energy efficiency, attracting uh, the, and retaining those 25 to 35 year olds, you know, all, all of these various things. So, uh, so in fact, there's, you know, those properties, um, I in my database now, I've got over, when we wrote the book, June and I, in 2000, it was published in 2008, at the very end, uh, we had about 80 case studies. I now have over 1,300 in my database, and that's without really being systematic or trying. I could easily triple it, I think, if I even if I just focused on the corridor measure this. Um, but what is driving this enormous amount of suburban redevelopment are several factors, but number one are the significant demographic shifts and changes in generational preferences. And I, you know, yes, the baby boom is a big generation. The baby boom have been in the suburbs. They were the babies that most of our suburbs were built for most of their entire lives. But, and this is sort of a newsflash for most people. I mean, we think of the suburbs as family focused. That's not who actually lives there. We saw a little bit of this demographic info before, but over two-thirds of suburban households since 2000, for 15 years now, two-thirds of suburban households have not had kids in them. Through 2035, 85% of new households are expected not to have kids in them. So the baby boomer, and most of this is because the baby boomers are empty nesters. Now, they're still in the suburbs, but their kids have left. Um, you know, then you have Gen X, generation in their 30s and 40s. Most of them are in the suburbs, are raising kids, but they're a small generation. There aren't enough Gen Xers to fill all the existing single family homes that the boomers will vacate. Then you get Gen Y, the folks in their 20s, early 30s, who have made it very clear they do not want to become their parents. And they, uh, it, though there are some interesting little parallels there because they don't want to become their parents. They want to live in, in cities. I mean, the, the baby boomers, my generation, we grew up watching Law and Order, Hell Street Blues, the cities are scary, crime-ridden places full of drama and grit. Um, you know, well, the Gen Y kind of grew up with Friends, Seinfeld, the cities are fun, playful uh, play, places to be. And the reality is, that's not just in TV. It's true. The cities are much more livable, great places, by and large. Not everyone, but by and large. Um, so you got the Gen Y that wants to live in an urban core. 77% say they want to live in an urban core. But 84% of jobs today are in the suburbs. Now, some of that is shifting into the cities, but still, we're talking, in, you know, the vast majority of jobs are still in the suburbs. So you've got a whole lot of Gen Y looking for an urban lifestyle, 
And hey, frankly, most of them can't really afford the downtown if it's really become a hip, gentrified, cool place. Um, so they're actually, they are part of what is driving the market for uh, redeveloping the suburbs, but also the boomers. Now that they're empty nesters, that the privacy that they loved of the big leafy lawn and the big house and the birds, once you've retired, A, it's a lot to keep up, and B, it's kind of lonely. And the boomers sometimes are referred to by demographers as the yippies. Youthful, energetic, elderly people into everything. They want to volunteer, they want to be in your face, they want to walk to places, they want to rule the world like we always have. Um, you know, we're not just going to settle for the little electric scooters. We and the little the golf courts. We're going to want the golf courts and the scooters to go 60 miles an hour. It's not just bike lanes. We're going to need our own. I mean, I don't know. One can only imagine. Um, but so, so the but the, the boomers want to age in place. They want to stay in their same suburban community, but they too, many of them are looking for a more urban lifestyle. So that's, that's a lot of what is really driving this. Um, and then there's you know, some other uh, bullet points up here. I mean, you know, it's, it, there's just a the sort of re-centralization of a lot of those first ring suburbs. When a lot of suburbs, their mentality is still, we're a suburb, downtown is behind us. But the fact is, as the metro has grown and grown and grown, the suburbs now have a relatively central location, those, er those early suburbs in particular. They can become a destination if they so choose. It takes changing the mindset. So um, the, and the other really, really important factor that drives um, almost all of the retrofits so is the need for leadership, usually coming out of the public sector. I mean, if you've got a strong mayor, a strong, someone, a strong on council, Someone strong, um, it, it could be in the, in the, in the um, planning department, uh, but there's almost always a champion who is really uh, helping to make these projects happen. So, uh, you know, is retrofitting really feasible? Well, you know, my database keeps growing. I, I think it is. We're just in the category of dead malls. Um, there are 24 that have been completely redeveloped into the downtowns, their suburb that's never had. Uh, they have a grid of streets, shops, ground floor, apartments and offices up above. 24 already built, 31 more under construction, another 80 wannabes. Uh, get one on that one. Um, but the reality is we will never retrofit or redevelop every single one of these, you know, sort of dead mall, dead strip mall sites. So it's up to communities to be very strategic and targeted. Where do you want to put your energy and your resources to try to, uh, to, to help the, the, your community be retrofitted into the future that you desire? Um, and it, because it, we built just too much of this stuff to really, uh, or certainly to, to make it all um, into everything we want. So, and the reality is also, when a property dies, one of the first questions to ask is, why? What, what killed it? Um, and you know, so often, it may be there is no more middle class. The middle class jobs have really gone. And no, you are not going to be able to really create some you know, expensive um, new, uh, a lot of new con construction. Um, in other cases, there, you know, you may, it, the market might be red hot and absolutely, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do. But so, because of this sort of, uh, these different strategies and different markets, June and I categorize the urban design strategies as really three basic, simple urban design strategies on these properties. Um, there are loads of examples of dead Walmarts turned into libraries, churches, um, Rec recreation centers, educational facilities. Um, this is an example of Willingboro. It was one of the very first Levitt towns uh, in New Jersey, where, and this was their commercial strip, uh, but it all had gone quite vacant. By removing one building to build a town green, 
Then they got a library, came in and took over the old Woolworths, the old Sears became a job center, a community college came in. I mean, they created a town center really for you know, kind of next to nothing. Um, but just by re-inhabiting the buildings um, and, you know, and, and really re in the process, they also re-localized it. What had all the national chains and kind of could be anywhere now became a real t a town center uh, for that community, much more geared to that community. So rehabilitation often, you know, there's not a whole lot of market, and it often is the most sustainable thing to do, just reuse what you've got. But uh, in a stronger market, it makes certainly makes a lot of sense for to do redevelopment. So here's another a town center. Um, this is the first of the dead mall retrofits. Meisner Park uh, in Boca Raton was a dead enclosed mall. The land defaulted to the city. The city then set up a redevelopment authority. And the city stipulated at that time that two thirds of the land would remain public space. So the design creates a linear park in the center flanked by uh, retail at ground and apartments and offices above. It's been added to several, uh, seven times since it was written each time at a sort of higher price point. Um, and so, that, so the redevelopment strategy is one of really densifying, urbanizing, and diversifying, and really creating the downtown that, uh, that a community may, may not have had before. But the third strategy is also really, really important. Uh, sometimes it makes more sense to re-green the sites that we never should have built on in the first place. Uh, it was fairly common in, before the Clean Water Act to drain the wetlands. And this is an example of one where a big strip mall was built in Minnesota on the site of a former wetland. Well, not only did the strip mall fail, so did the culvert underneath, and the parking lot was perking. So they were able to get grant uh, for purely e ecological reasons to reconstruct uh, the wetland. It happened to be on a major migratory bird route. Well, in the process, that created lakefront property, which then attracted the first new private investment in over 40 years to a very, very low-income neighborhood. So often, one finds that actually regreening is a, is a great strategy for building value uh, that then uh, can, can attract more private development while also uh, really serving all the, the, per the great purposes of parks and, uh, and things too. And there's also already some uh, mention of it of Chris Weinberger's work, a uh, professor at George Washington University and, and a developer who's been looking at the value that walkability adds to real estate. And I consulted with him on the Atlanta study, but I mean, overall, finding pretty dramatic uh, rent premiums associated with walkability. And, but finding, if you compare, I mean, the cities that have a walkable downtown are also the ones that are getting the higher premium. So Dallas is kind of a little low there, um, and Atlanta and parts is, is a little low compared to Boston and Washington. And this kind of gets to a little bit, you know, really the, the, the question, even though Meinberger says most of this, the, walk, the new walkable environments, I mean, you get just those same high rents if you're building, redeveloping a suburb in a walkable manner, but it's very rare to be able to demonstrate and prove the market for urban living in the suburbs first. It almost always, you have to get your downtown right and prove the market for urban living in the downtown. And then the suburb, you, you know, you can start uh, kind of kicking it off. In fact, we, we find uh, generally there's a twin boom. If the downtown, once the market for urban housing in downtown goes up, that's when you start to see the kind of um, suburban redevelopment going on. So, um, question here. Nathan asked me to specifically kind of focus, because of the Plan Lafayette does identify uh, several possible town center sites. Um, I thought I would focus this talk really around a lot, I'll show a lot of case studies of, of some retrofits that are town centers, but wanted to just sort of ask you guys, you know, 
town center with the E is sort of my kind of snarky way to refer to a strip mall that you know maybe has a pitched roof on it and then calls itself the town center. Um, you need so if you've got four possible nodes, you know you've got well, what's the difference between a strip mall and a town center, and what kind of town center zip do you want? What are you looking for? Uh, anyone want to want to shout out what what is? I mean, so we heard one already this morning. Um, but Robert, Robert Gibbs gave the ULI definition of a town center versus a lifestyle center, which is that a town center has to have at least three different uses. Sure. So, so um, in transit planning, I would say it's the box that we put in questionnaires for personal business, which is like if you want to go like the boring post office or the boring, you know, get pay your gas bill. Um, so so it's a civic use, something that municipal yeah, public yeah, civic yeah, use. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I absolutely, you know, certainly that I would hold that as a bar, but, but if you have four different town centers in the same town, are you going to really have... Are, should all four of them be, have a city hall, have a post office, have a... That's a per capita thing, too. Mm-hmm. Have some community center or personal business. That's one thing. Absolutely. But you, in general, you know, you probably aren't going to want to have all four have the exact same mix of uses. Some, you're, you're, gonna ha you know, you're probably going to want to see them, what, some of them become a little more just neighborhood oriented, some of them become bigger oriented. But certainly, you, you're not going to want them to be all retail. Uh, you're probably going to want to have there to be something about them that is distinctive, that is not just the same chain stores you're going to find everywhere, but something that actually, if it's really going to be a town, a center of your town, it's going to identify your neighborhoods, you're going to want, it's going to, you're going to want it to have some character that, uh, it, it, that be, makes it, a, you can identify, you know, people who live there will identify that. That's my neighborhood center. Um, anything else? All right, one more question. So, if we're if the sites and I haven't visited Lafayette, so I don't know, but from what Nathan told me, the sites of the town centers, some of them are along arterials, those big, the big nasty roads. So, which comes first, retrofitting the corridor or? The parcel, the node, the properties alongside the public right of way. Well, easy yes no answer. Yes. The legal one would be the corridor. The legal answer is it depends. I'll, I mean, honestly, I will. I can show you. Ex I will show you some examples of each that have fit, that have succeeded and have failed. There is, you know, there, it really does, I think, very much depend. Um, I think the best answer is both should be planned at the same time. <laughs> uh, but, but it doesn't always happen that way. So uh, we already saw this lovely example. Peter Swift showed the uh, Lancaster, California Boulevard corridor. I mean, a fabulous project um, of taking a, the, the five-laner, putting it on a road diet down to two, really taking an existing node that already had decent bones but was not doing well, and then making a public investment in the public right of way that has completely upgraded the whole, the whole node. So even though this is a corridor project, it already had the node there that just, you know, has and has since seen quite a bit of, um, of development since. Um, other projects I've really just focused on. Oh, missing, that's too bad. One of the images didn't come through. Um, not sure what's going on there, but uh, anyway, this is a, a corridor that was redeveloped in Washington from a five laner to imagine, if you will, the sidewalks, the bike lanes, <laughs> a median in the middle. 
Um, and this one was, is an old one. I mean, this was really started back in 1995. The Washington DOT was really interested in improving safety. There had been a lot of crashes. There were no sidewalks on the existing condition. Um, lots of pedestrians getting hit. City Council was interested in a town center, and they wanted to really push. But the town center is in 2015, right now, finally under construction. So these things can take a really long time. Uh, you know, and this is a good corridor retrofit, uh, one and a half miles. And it did reduce the crashes, but it's really been slow. Um, I'm getting, oh, okay. Now there's dramatic pause, we get the. <laughs> And that's an old picture. There's that sort of the, when they did the retrofit. It's now really lush. That's grown up a lot. Um, here's another corridor retrofit. This is the first example in the U.S. of a retrofit of a suburban strip into a multi-way boulevard in Cathedral City. Um, quite dramatic. There's a whole story of how the city actually took back ownership of the highway when the DOT wanted to widen it and further kill what was left of their main street. And they said, no, we want to rebuild our main street. And so they made the multi-way boulevard extremely attractive, all with the intentions of rebuilding their downtown. They built a city hall, built a park, and nothing since. Um, sadly, this project has also just, now some of that is it's hit the recession, it, the, the redevelopment authorities in California uh, were dismantled, um, but the downtown has yet to emerge. So, you know, sometimes we, we see these, sometimes uh, things aren't happening quite the way they were. Now here, on the other hand, is a project that just focused on the node. Uh, this is Santana Row, perhaps the most upscale retrofit. Um, Gucci's and Ferragamo and, you know, folks are here on a site that used to be a, uh, a strip mall. It's in Silicon Valley in San Jose. Um, used to be a strip mall, and it's still on Stevens Creek Boulevard, which is a big, not very attractive uh, boulevard, uh, you know, a commercial strip, and was rebuilt, uh, redeveloped by Federal Realty um, with a very kind of high end and quite a substantial mix of retail at the ground, a lot of very expensive condos, apartments. Um, and now, um, this is now just looking at the new kind of extension of it with a, a lot of new office coming in. Uh, the retail has really been seen as kind of a perk now that, that the office markets are getting very high rents by, you know, this is unusual for Silicon Valley to kind of have urban office uh, coming into San Jose. But um, so here's this, you know, uh, retrofit of, of a strip mall that has become really very urban with very uh, dense, walkable mix of uses, and yet nothing changing on the corridor. There's been some talk of a little bit of streetscaping, but um, as far as I know, nothing really happening on the corridor. So the best projects, as I said, I think, are those where the two are planned together. So here's a project by uh, Victor Dover. Dover, of Dover Cole, a prominent new urbanist firm. This is Columbia Pike in Northern Virginia, a three and a half mile stretch that was, what they did was they looked at the whole stretch and then they up zoned at the four major intersections to create nodes um, using a form-based code to allow much greater density at the intersections and with the uh, assumption that the uh, tax revenue from that additional development would go towards uh, helping to put in a streetcar uh, along the corridor. So, you, so they've also, and as they're doing this, then they've done quite a bit of investment in streetscaping um, and improving the place. And so in the midst of the recession, in a, on a corridor that had only seen one new project in the previous 30 years, which was a new CVS that took one year for the community to negotiate a brick facade on the CVS. Um, you know, that's sort of the, the standard process. Um, they 
put in the form-based code. It gives the developer, the community, the predictability they deserve of knowing that, okay, they're going to allow 12-story buildings on the corridor, but it has to taper down to three in the back where it meets the existing neighborhood. So the community is getting the predictability that it deserves, and the developer is getting the predictability of knowing they're not going into a negotiated process. If they conform to the code, they go ahead. Six new buildings in the height of the recession on Columbia Pike, in its essence, induced by the form-based code. Um, Unfortunately, there was a change in city council and the streetcar has been nixed, at least for now. Um, so we're, we're still kind of waiting to see how all this goes. Um, a little closer to home here in Baton Rouge, the Nicholson Drive is looking at getting a streetcar and is looking at simultaneously uh, redeveloping the nodes as the, uh, they plan for the streetcar to connect up LSU and downtown. So. All right, now another one of these questions. So which comes first, the public or the private sector in terms of retrofitting? Who should be take, who, who takes the lead in imagining these projects and getting them going? Exactly. Yeah, it, it is often really either one, and in the end, unless it's both, <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. I know, these are somewhat rhetorical questions. Um, but it's also, it really is to make the point, there is no one single way to do this. Um, so this is Belmar, probably the most famous of the Dead Mall retrofits. Um, again, just like Meisner Park, uh, the, the, the mall died, the land defaulted to the city, the city set up a redevelopment authority and issued an RFQ looking for developers to come in and fix their mall. Well, no one came forward to fix their mall. We're not, we're building a handful of new malls, but we basically stopped building malls in this country and developers are not, in, not very interested. So a very good developer uh, actually came to them and said, well, I'll build you the downtown you never had. Uh, Lakewood was a, a, a series of subdivisions that were an, that annexed together, and they never, it's true, they never had a downtown. So it went from being a 100-acre super block site to now 22 blocks, uh, very walkable with public streets, with um, retail on the ground floors of sort of the two main streets, and then a wide variety of different kinds of houses housing, some office, um, and really it's already outperforming the, in terms of tax revenue, it's outperforming the mall at the mall's um, you know, peak. Uh, and, and really, you know, the community initially was extremely suspicious. They didn't want downtown. They sort of said, if we want downtown, we go to Denver. It's six miles away. Um, but they've really, they've now uh, very much kind of embrace, embraced it. Um, and other examples of, I think, you know, the, the public sector often can be kind of, so that was sort of reluctant public sector taking the lead, but um, this is one where the public sector absolutely playing a strong lead. This is uh, the DeSoto Town Center in south, da south of Dallas, where the community was concerned about um, Hampton Road, what had been their main street, really decaying uh, over the years, and a lot of vacancies, so they the, the city initially paid for a study to look at the whole corridor and what could happen to some of those parcels. They then issued an RFQ and this particular little two and a half acre strip mall um, then was redeveloped. And what's interesting in this example is, so this was a little old L, it was an L-shaped strip mall that in uh, 1995 um, had gone dead and the city had moved City Hall, a library, and a rec center active. Then, to help re revitalize the corridor, then they built the housing on, to, on the parking lot at, around a parking garage. So then they did, so, you know, that was the redevelopment, and they re-greened and connected to a walking trail um, alongside a creek on the side. So really, really making quite a substantial place out of, um, 
what had just been a little strip mall. Uh, this is a, one of the more, again, you know, I think the public sector often needs to be the one to really take the lead, especially when there are, are uh, issues that are not going to be solved by a development on its own. This is Wyandanch Rising in Babylon, New York, uh, often considered the most economically distressed community in Long Island. Uh, very, very poor um, majority, minority uh, neighborhood, but it does have a Long Island Railroad train station. But the, the city's zoning had not allowed any on-street parking. It had all required all off-street parking along its main street le leading to the station. Well, and that had ended up, it was all used by commuters, and so it killed the retail. The retail didn't work anymore, and it just, the, the, they completely, very little local jobs left. Um, so, but a, a champion emerged, the county manager, Steve Ballone, uh, for the county, really, he got a charrette going, brought in some new urbanists. Um, he helped lead efforts to acquire a substantial portion of the land, issue an RFQ, get developers on board, and then um, go after several county and federal grants. And a couple that were particularly interesting is there's no sewer in uh, this part of Long Island. And they're actually, they've been able to use funding to put a sewer into, under the main street and, and but while they're doing that, they're going to be able to turn the main street into a boulevard because that's otherwise really expensive. So it's often you know you find these sort of other ways to help pay uh, to to do things. And the uh, first two blocks of affordable housing are going up right now. Um, but you know, it's that connection of affordable housing to affordable transportation that in that case is so key. This is an example from uh, Bellevue, Washington, again of a sort of proactive public sector, but in a kind of modest way. Um, in Bellevue, the, the community f saw that a l all of a sudden, a lot of their strip malls were really going downhill. Um, and a Costco had just opened up. And they basically said, you know, that Costco is killing a lot of our strip malls. So they start at, they went at, they approached all, several of the strip malls, I think all of them in that, the community at the time, and sort of said, what can we do to help? And so they, and the city agreed to pay half the cost of a study of options. Um, and then they, uh, in this particular one, this is the first one to rebuild. So the city committed to build a new library, which has opened on the corner here. Uh, there's some new office space that's been built. They're tucking under, parking underneath, and putting in housing around the back, making a, a there will be a sort of plaza and amphitheater. Um, but it's, you know, working very closely with the developer. And um, in this case, the developer feels like, you know, it's, it's been slow going. But because it's really connected, this was the, the strip mall of all the strip malls. This is the one that's going ahead because it is immediately, it's in a residential neighborhood. I mean, people can walk to this one. It's not on the messy, nasty arterial. So this is the one you know, that is going first. And it's, it's worth uh, noticing that. Other communities have also found a lot of retail um, that was designed to be sort of regional scale malls are now finding that as we've built so much retail uh, that now they need to right size down. So this is a case in New Jersey, the uh, Voorhees Town Center was a big regional mall. It started having huge vacancies. It never, wasn't doing it all well. So the developer per bought it and literally chopped off off half the mall, demolished half of it, and then rebuilt a main street for that half. <laughs> And then the city moved City Hall into uh, the mall. Uh, and they're really you know, making some pretty nice connections to an existing library, senior center. Um, you know, we're seeing kind of just interesting, you know, a lot of interesting examples of how do you kind of take what you've got um, and, and work with it. Um, another sort of public sector-led problem that a lot of these properties are facing is flooding. 
this is in Connecticut, a dead mall that partially died because the site kept flooding. It was built right on top. I mean, when you look at the water <laughs> drainage, like what were they thinking building a mall there? So now the city has taken the lead. They're building it as a stormwater park that will hopefully hold enough water so that the rest of the neighborhood can also will never flood again um, and, and help revitalize around it. This, uh, this one is also, I think, pretty amazing. It's pretty blurred out here, but um, this is a 500-acre office park outside of Philadelphia that was built in the 50s on top of four creeks. Again, we just thought what used to be normal. Well, now, after 70 years, there's uh, a, a lot more development upstream and more and more severe weather. Those culverts can't handle it, and it's, and it's flooding in the low-lying areas. So the city has now just approved a plan of transfer of development rights from the low-lying areas to the remaining part of the park that is on the high ground, which they're laying out with a new urbanist plan. It happens to also be, as a lot of office parks are sometimes, are the older ones that used to be industrial parks. It's right on a commuter rail line to Philadelphia. Uh, they hope to eventually you know, uh, be able to build, build a station in there. Um, uh, lots of interesting examples. Um, this one is actually a thriving mall in uh, uh, Seattle that had also built on top of the headwaters of a major, one of the four major salmon streams. And so when the mall wanted to expand, uh, the mayor had to negotiate a land swap. And so the mall gave up the whole bottom half of its parking lot. Half of that became a transit center. It will get light, it's light rail in uh, 2020. And then the other half, they daylit uh, the, the creek. Um, they, it, they, and then built senior housing, market rate housing, and really, you know, urbanizing uh, the whole edge of that. You know, instead of it just being a pipe in the ground, it's now an amenity that adds property value. Uh, that, you know, it makes this now an attractive place, what used to be the parking lot of the mall. Um, and with the very poetic name, the Thornton Creek Water Quality Channel. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, th there's all sorts of folks that can take the lead. This one is an interesting example where, in fact, it was a citizen-led lawsuit that resulted in the redevelopment. The, but whereas we often think of the lawsuits as coming from the NIMBYs, the people resisting development, you know, they don't, they want, they don't want development. In this case, it was citizens saying. You've, saying, we want more development. This is a site in Somerville, Massachusetts that had transit line running across it that for years they'd been asking the transit authority to open a station there, but there, there was no station at the time, so the city had permitted IKEA to come and just build a big store there, and the citizens said, look, the, the purpose of the zoning code is to you know, look out for the citizens' long-term interests, and you have just totally undercut us. And they, got, they were able to stall the decision long enough that IKEA pulled out. It's now a, a major mixed-use redevelopment with uh, about 30,000 jobs planned. They've already built the first, first phase. The transit station is in. Um, it's, it's a big... Uh, it's a big uh, a big project, and also with some really interesting health aspects. But um, there's a cautionary tale that sometimes public sector can get a little too ahead of itself. Um, this is Mantua, New York, or Malta, New York, where um, it's a small you know, rural community, really, kind of uh, in upstate New York, about um, 15 miles from Saratoga Springs. And, but they kind of hit the jackpot in that a deal had been negotiated for a new high-tech manufacturing facility to bring in 2,000 high-tech jobs. And so the city said, great, well, we're going to do a form-based code, we're going to do transect zoning, and we want to recreate downtown Saratoga Springs in our community. So they hired good firms that really did a good job. But here's, this is all to scale. This is the size of downtown Saratoga Springs. So they were trying to recreate downtown Saratoga Springs 
but they had 16 times more land and no way near that much new development. Um, so, you know, they did a, really a good form-based code, um, all well-intentioned, but they've been, and they have had some development come in, but it's all now in random pieces, completely fragmented. Um, the lesson, the takeaway on this is, you know, there's a tendency, politically especially, to want to spread the wealth, spread the peanut butter, and, and, and control, you know, try to establish a great plan and, and, and the benefits of that plan. Um, but you really do need to be extremely targeted. And it would have been much, much better if they had actually only released and allowed this piece to get built and then one contiguous to it and one contiguous to that. Would have been so much better um, than kind of where, where they've ended up. Uh, there's also often a role for the nonprofit sector to take the lead in some of these. This is a retrofit of a dead mall in Wysada, Minnesota that had been built on top of a wetland, had uh, been draining runoff into the lake for decades. The mall died and Presbyterian Homes came in. Presbyterian Homes is, uh, was start, it provides senior housing um, essentially as, as a nonprofit. So they've, they're integrating senior housing with cinema and grocery and other retail um, right at the end of the main street, so connecting to the main street. Uh, and, and really, I think, you know, doing a, a, a great service is kind of, you know, this is the kind of senior housing the boomers are actually really looking for. It's sold out well before it was finished. Um, but it's all, what's also cool about this project is they're building the whole thing four feet above grade because it has such a high water table. They're putting cisterns underneath all the streets to capture every drop of stormwater. There will be zero runoff uh, from this site. Well, and in the process, that means they're doing everything pile construction. So in the process, they're also digging geothermal wells and providing a source of renewable energy uh, for the project. And so you know, one sees a lot of these projects now starting to kind of address multiple uh, challenges at once. And again, you know, nonprofits can often be the anchors. Um, hospitals here in New Orleans East. I think there's a terrific plan. I don't, I, I wish more was happening with it, um, where the, the Katrina wiped out a hospital and a mall. The hospital has been rebuilt, and so the hospital has been actually leading the efforts to try to say, look, we, we, we should rebuild this in a much more urban way. Um, and, and really do, had some great planning. Um, so they're, they're at least trying um, on some of that. But um, often it's the private sector which is taking the lead. So here's uh, one, again, one of the really, uh, the oldest of the retrofits. This is Mashpee Commons. It was a family owned strip mall on a huge sea of parking. And over the course of 20 years, the owners simply built a New England village on top of the parking lots. At that point, it was illegal to have on-street parking, so they simply called the streets parking lots. <laughs> That's what they were. <laughs> so um, it's gotten easier uh, to, to do some of these things. And they now have permission to connect that up to some more uh, compact neighborhoods. Um, a more recent uh, version of, a, again, a small sort of developer-led note along an arterial. This is Taxi. Um, this is the project all of my students want to go to. Uh, this was an old taxi distribution center, basically a parking lot with an auto body repair um, outside of Denver, just, just outside in the River North area. Old industrial buildings. They rehabbed the old buildings, built some new buildings. Uh, the big amenity is a swimming pool made of shipping containers. Um, and it's just super hip. It's the anti-cubicle corporate workplace. It screams, you know, this is for the entrepreneurial startup. This is, um, you know, the incubator uh, innovation district kind of um, kind of a, of a retrofit. I mean, and you know, but one sees a lot of kind of interesting ideas. That project, actually, at the back, um, Taxi now has been so successful. It's now spawned other uh, projects, redevelopments along the same corridor, and now they're actually starting a corridor uh, retrofit and putting in sidewalks, because they literally didn't even have sidewalks on that, in what was a sort of old suburban uh, industrial road. Um, so you know, changing the infrastructure, again, it, things, projects might start sort of public or private sector. Um, this is uh, 
Paslow on 8th in the Lloyd District in Portland, which is the suburban part of Portland. You can kind of see downtown is across the river. This is the super block area, um, office buildings and parking lots. And they just brought light rail uh, right in front of these office buildings. So now a developer is building residential um, on, those, on top of those parking lots. And is building the world's, lar the nation's largest living machine. A living machine is a system for recycling not just the gray water, but also the black water, the toilet water. Uh, it goes through a series of essentially reed beds uh, with a skylight and gets co it, you end up with drinking water at the end as a completely uh, sort of sustainable process. And he's doing it because he says it's actually cheaper than paying for the sewer hookup. So we're getting to the point, now I'm sure there's some subsidies involved in this, but uh, and I, I lo I'm looking forward to doing a lot more research on this project, but um, we, got, we are getting to the point where our buildings, we have the technology to make buildings that themselves have such a light footprint that it's now easy to actually infill them and then not to have an enormous ripple effect on the rest of the infrastructure. This particular uh, uh, project is actually going to have more bike parking spaces than car parking spaces per residential unit. They're, they're also having some extra ones for the retail. Um, but so, you know, lots of just interesting things. Um, more projects, more projects. This one is another one, the domain uh, outside of Austin, 12 miles north of Austin. This is the site where Selectric typewriters were made. That used to be the, go oh, you know, <laughs> that was high tech at one point. Um, and a lot of IBM R&D. And it was bought in 1999 by some developers who thought they would build a dot-com campus. Then the dot-com crash hit, and they sort of thought, well, maybe some new urbanist retail would work here. Um, so they partnered with Simon and built a, a, a very lovely lifestyle center with retail at the ground floor and apartments and office above. Uh, the city agreed to um, help subsidize that in order to try to, they were arguing that they were subsidizing it in order to raise the quality of the standards. If you want to have real curbs, you want to see uh, you know, the, the quality of that pedestrian experience elevated and the pedestrian eye rewarded with a quality experience, in order to raise that, the city agreed to it some tax incentives. Um, that led to a referendum, a, a stop domain, tax subsidies, big fuss, um, but in the end, the project has more than paid the city back. Um, it did set a new standard, and now the third phase is they're constructing a lot, a significant amount of new office and, and residential. So it really is becoming um, Austin's sort of second downtown. Uh, the public sector sort of respond, it really was kicked off. The public sector admits that the developers, it was not, this area was not on their, on the city's radar. But the idea of capturing some of the tax revenue right close to the city border. They, they like that idea. Um, so then now then the city has come forward with a plan for 2035. There's a new light rail station that just opened a couple of years ago. They've got uh, bus rapid transit going downtown from the site. So really seeing a lot of, you know, again, sort of pu private sector does something, public sector does something, you know, this sort of back and forth um, kind of, of of each of them, each having a role, the sort of public sector and private sector in um, pulling all this together. Uh, White Flint is another, I think, actually very, very interesting example of this kind of public and private, uh, each having very strong roles. This is the six major property owners were approached by the county when the county said, look, it's time to update the comprehensive plan. Um, and the property owners decided that they would rather be proactive than let the city tell them what to do. So the six property owners, and I think it's key that it was only six. Six was enough to kind of for them to really work together. They formed a partnership. Uh, they recognized that Bethesda, just two stops down, this is about 30 mile metro ride from DC, two stops down, Bethesda was getting three or four times the rents that they were getting. And they said, you know, it used, Bethesda used to look like us. Um, so they hired uh, Gladding Jackson to come in and look at how could you put in, what would a street grid 
look like if you were to try to create, make this into walkable urbanism. Uh, and so all of those, uh, the blue streets are all new streets um, in that map. They, and so then the, uh, the property owners agreed to a, the rate will fluctuate some, but basically a 10% increase in property taxes for the construction of public roads on their private property. And in exchange, they get to build a lot more densely. So this is the, on the far left there is the first 30-story tower uh, that's been built as a result of this and some of the new streets. The one in the middle is a just broken ground on the site of a Chili's. Um, these are, there's sort of the, uh, one of the sites of this. This is a 430 acre total, so that's about a, a 30 acre there. Um, the build out and kind of what it looks like uh, this year. Um, they're also, so now the city has agreed, the county has agreed to try to work on retrofitting Rockville Pike. They don't have the funding yet, but they're hoping to put bus rapid transit down the center median to basically extend the connection to that metro station. Uh, they are committed to much really working on the public realm, the design of those sidewalks. You know, yes, that will still be a heavily trafficked road, uh, but they are trying to make it as lush as possible. So the first pieces that have been built um, are actually really quite remarkable. It's a bioswale, but it's designed with uh, a very high quality. So um, this just sort of shows the, the evolution of the project. And again, I think that the different steps. One of the important things um, that's happening here, so the, the private sector really sort of took the lead in forming the partnership and really set, setting the tone of what they were, that they were willing to you know, insert a street grid on their property. Uh, but the public sector's role now is that the public sector still monitors the issuing of zoning permits. So it's only as each piece of street, new street gets built that you're allowed to build a new tall building. And so they're really monitoring and keeping track of that, and I think in a, in a very um, interesting and reasonable way. But now this gets us to one of the questions, too, of, um, you know, uh, John talked, and, and, and a lot of New Orleans have really been talking about the importance of lean, of small. You know, we love the cities that were built over time, and, and in so many small increments, you feel that patina. Those are the places that feel authentic, as opposed to the brand new, instant, um, kind of big cities with everything is big. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, a question, I think, you know, as we're retrofitting the suburbs. Because, yes, I love the cities that develop, that develop incrementally, but that works only if you already have a walkable network of streets. And in suburbia, most of the time, you don't. The only, we haven't figured out, there is no ferry infrastructure, infrastructure ferry. We haven't figured out how to do incremental infrastructure. And so most of the time, we really, I think we have to redevelop suburbia in big chunks. Now there's going to be phasing as we do that, but it's still, um, in order to get that infrastructure, and frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the idea that we might sometimes, the buildings are going to be a little cheap, but hey, if we got the street grid, the buildings will come and go. Getting in the street, the street grids will stay. So there are lots of different strategies for how to try to incorporate big and small together. Uh, this is a really a project I quite like, uh, the Mosaic District in, um, in Northern Virginia, about 15 miles out of DC, that combines things like a big target, but the target is actually above the ground floor little small boutique shops. You go up an escalator, the target is on the top floor, but it works. Um, you get uh, a lot, they've, they've got a lot of big floor plate office on upper floors above small little shops. They sort of are playing with the grain um, in, in basically some interesting ways. But the phasing, is, the phasing is critical and it does not always work. I mean, these are some diagrams that Dover Cole produced many years ago of sort of how you take a mall and you start to slowly create, number one, create a sense of place, put in a town green, make something that, you know, uh, is a place to go to, then get a street 
connection, that, you know, buildings alongside that street, and hope you're going to be able to build on top of the rest of those parking lots eventually, you know, that it becomes profitable so you can afford to build the parking garages. Uh, but sadly, that one still looks like that. It has not gotten to the next phase. Um, Sometimes I think some of the kind of short term, shorter term, temporary things we can do uh, is anticipatory retrofitting, where in this case, this was a dead mall outside of Denver. Uh, the department store has been turned into a civic center. And the left side of the project is basically urban. But on the right side, there's Walmart. And you know that Walmart's not going to last very long. But the parking lots in front of that Walmart were designed to be future building sites. So the utilities that were put into the Walmart are going through the future street. The street trees of the parking lot are also going to be nice, beautiful, mature trees by the time that Walmart um, kind of dies. So, so there are various strategies that can be a little bit more kind of short term. Um, and I think I'm going to stop it there. There's lots more little short term um, kinds of things one can do. Pilot projects, experiments are so important. You know, people are understandably nervous about things like road diets, but this is a road diet that they're doing for 18 months and absolutely going to just track and monitor, you know, sort of what happens. And nobody can say no to an experiment. You know, as I said, I started this as saying I, I had an, I did an experiment and um, with, with living car free. So I want to... Um, Close. Uh, there are obstacles. I think we kind of mentioned most of these. Ultimately, I think you know what I'm seeing in retrofits going forward now is that in addition to trying to address the problems of auto dependency, we're getting more and more really creative solutions to how to layer uh, all, and address all sorts of issues. So affordability, public health, social capital, jobs, water, energy, waste, all of that. Um, and so I'm working on book two uh, and and showing we're going to highlight the projects that are really doing the best job uh, that we can all learn from kind of on some of those. If you're enjoying the conversation, I do want to invite all of you to, uh, you know, come to, um, to CNU 24. And if, um, if any of you know any students who would be interested in doing some of this, I coordinate a project uh, program at Georgia Tech in urban design, and I am actively recruiting more students for a post-professional one-year degree. Come and talk to me if you're interested. Thanks. <laughs>